audience here. And, um, and welcome everyone um, to Education Now, which is the broadcast series that we started here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, where we hope to offer actionable insights and inspirations that uh, you can use every day um, in your lives as educators, parents, leaders. Um, we hope that what we surface in these brief conversations um, will provide hope, um, add, to the, add fuel to the push for equity um, and create the circumstances uh, for transformation across education. My name is Barry Walsh. I'm one of the producers of the Education Now series. Um, and I am really looking forward to today's conversation where we, we kind of dig into this idea of what, what uh, can make schools more human. Um, but before we kick that off, I wanna let you know that uh, the episode's being recorded and will be available to view on the Harvard Graduate School of Education's YouTube channel, Facebook page, and you can visit hgse.me slash ednow for recordings and information about what we have coming up in the series. Um, you can also put your questions into the Q&A button at the bottom. Um, you'll see that at the bottom of your Zoom screens. Um, and closed caption access is uh, down there at the bottom of the screen as well. Um, and now I'm delighted to bring our guests in. Um, I'm so happy to have Jal Mehta, Professor of Education here at HGSE, and Devon LaRosa, who's the principal of La Follette High School in Madison, Wisconsin. And um, we just looked that up to figure out that we were pronouncing it correctly. Um, so hopefully that's the case. Thank you, Devon. Um, you two know each other and have been working together. So I want to just get into it and offer um, the prompt to just, um, um, build off of my questions, talk to one another, um, wh whatever you have to say, I think we, we will learn from. Um, but Jal, I was gonna start with you. Um, and I just wanted to talk a bit about what this pandemic has exposed. I think um, most of us on this uh, webinar um, are aware and, and already have been aware of, of the, the, in, the inequities that exist um, across education um, that were laid bare by this uh, pandemic. But what about some of the other failings um, or shortcomings or challenges in our current system that really were exposed or highlighted in this pandemic? Jal? Uh, thanks, Barry. And good to see you, Devon. Likewise. Uh, <laughs> so um, I think the ways in which schools were unequal before the pandemic have just become more apparent during the pandemic. I mean, at the very extremes, you've got private schools where kids have been in school all year, um, sometimes, you know, renting tents and having heated outdoor experiences at the extreme to some of our poor kids, you know, congregating outside of McDonald's to grab some free internet so that they can be at school. And I, I really think that's just a big stain on us as a society. Like we have enough money for it not to be that way. And we just have chosen not to allocate our money uh, that way. So um, that's the sort of the biggest thing. A, a couple of sort of less apparent things. I think when kids are in school, there is a sense that kids will comply with what the teacher wants them to do, whether they're really interested in it or want to be there or have any intrinsic motivation or not. And I think that's just less in a remote environment. And so I think that the pandemic is sort of a miner's canary. It's kind of showing us the ways in which when kids are not compelled to do things, they often won't won't uh, won't do them. And what we're trying to do is create an environment where where kids want to be there. And I think some of the schools that I've worked with that have been the most uh, successful, and maybe Devon can can build on this. You know, if kids are invested in the work they're doing, if they're doing projects, if they're developing writing or other things that matter to them, I mean then, you know, Zoom just becomes a platform. It's similar to the way that adults meet. You know, you come together, you have a meeting, you do some work, et cetera. So um, those, are, those are a couple of things. Mm -hmm. Devon, what do you think? Yeah, I think you definitely called all of that out. And I think, I think you're 100% right. Um, the, the thing I was like, that like shined for me that like in the pandemic was like the academic tools that I have, right? And who has shown those to me? Right. And there's a disparity there. And I think I think we learned that very clearly in the pandemic. And um, and also, like, just like in the article that you that you that you wrote in New York Times, we got the shout out. 
Um, I would say like the need, the absolute need for social emotional learning. And I'm going to say like, it's got to be there, like above. I'm going to say like, it's, it's right there with the academic, if not even before that, um, because that's where it starts. So um, I think the pandemic, pandemic has shown us like there's, there's a great need and we have to, we have to call that out. So thank you. Yeah. Um, and, and, th and thanks to both of you for that. Um, it's um, something that I think is more apparent than it ever had been before, but um, those of you working in, you know, it, with our, our young learners in schools know, know this all too well. Um, Devon, as you kind of had to navigate, I want to, I want to, the, the, the question that I ask you after this one is going to be about what we can do to make schools more human, but I wanted to take a second to hear a little bit more reflection from you on um, what were some challenges as you sort of entered into that pandemic um, moment that you really, um, that, that sort of talked to you about those limitations in our system, that the toll of the pandemic, how did you experience that, would you say? And, 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 and the limitations maybe that you felt on your ability to respond? Um, yeah, I mean, there's like a million things I wanna say, but um, let me try to streamline and go for my notes. So the thing I would say is, let's just be clear and honest, not all internet is created equal, right? And access to internet and, and who and how and 5G and 2G and 3G, um, there, there was a disparity, right? And so when Jao talks about kids huddling to do homework around McDonald's, that's very true in my world. Um, and so in, in all the places I've worked, and I'm saying like, so, you know, what some people take for granted, like that was, that, that was a hurt, right? And how do we get you another charger? How do we get you a Chromebook? But then on the teacher side of things, we were never prepped for this, right? I was never prepped to be an online principal. I'm like, what does that even mean? Is it just meaning making looms and sending them to people and hope that they read them? Mm -hmm. So um, the problems were the biggest one for me, my kids are relational, right? They need to have that touch. They need to have that communication. So how are we doing it? Um, and Jolly's okay, I'm just gonna talk about just, just how we brought in the virtual mentors um, to truly be the way to connect. Because um, yes, I can read a book and yes, I can watch uh, a video of how to do something, but I need to have that connection with you. And yeah, you're on screen, but I'm gonna say, I need to be able to reach out to someone when I'm struggling and be able to text somebody or call somebody. I wanna be able to send an email at 10 o'clock and hopefully somebody will read it when I'm struggling. And so our virtual mentors that uh, our high schools took on in Madison um, really, really did that, right? We, we connected with students. So two students of mine today messaged me and said, LaRosa, are we still doing our virtual lunch? I sent them IHOP and French toast and we, we had a, um, a FaceTime and chatted. That's what they needed, right? And it's okay. Like, and we have a budget with a building with, with no people in it, right? And so that's what it needs to be. If kids need that, that's what it needs to be. If they need to call. And so our virtual mentors, we have 1600 kids divided out by 168 staff. Each person got 12 to 15 students. Um, please don't check my math. 12 to 15 students um, with, that you were their direct touch point. You were their contact. And so um, that's something we had to put in place very quickly. And we asked questions like, do you need anything? How can we help you? And then uh, I sent out a, um, an email saying, who wants to chat today just about driving and bad drivers? Kids quickly jumped on that and they wanted to chat about it. And that's okay. You have to have that human uh, connection with students. And I think it's most important to lead with that. And so I think that's something, which I want to jump ahead, like post pandemic, that, that has to be there, right? What's that going to look like? Yeah, that's, that's excellent. And, and um, uh, so that is obviously the relational piece is an essential part of this question of what does make schools more human. Um, I would love to hear you both talk a bit more about that. What, um, what does that mean to you? If you, if you, if you know that, that phrase um, make schools more human, um, maybe Jal and then Devon, you could just share a bit more on that. Sure. I mean, just imagine being a student in Devon's school. Like you can feel his presence through the Zoom screen. And uh, that, that's what good schools are like. They have that kind of culture and community. So I would say start with making sure every student is known, seen, and heard. Um, building relationships between the teachers and the students and also the families. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about how some places have navigated that in the pandemic, because I think it's been more critical than ever. 
uh, this year. Um, I think there is a, a real conversation we need to have about size and scale. I mean, I was talking to one of my former students and she said, you know, how come in education, like whenever things get bigger, they get more hierarchical. Um, you know, if you think about organizing as a tradition, there's a thing called snowflake organizing, which essentially means you get bigger, but each pod is still like about the same size. And I think uh, that is really the right way to think about it. So like, I don't know, my mom had been a teacher for a long time. And when I was writing that New York Times thing, I said, you know, I'd written a draft and it said something about teachers really knowing students and forming relationships. And she said, Joe, come on, like uh, high school teachers have 150 uh, students in their load. Like how in the world are they going to do that? And as usual, my mother is correct. Uh, and so, you know, some of the schools um, this year have moved to a, to a quarter system where they're, um, you know, running two or three or four learning experiences at a time instead of six or seven, which allows for longer blocks and teachers to have fewer students that they're uh, responsible for. Um, at a sort of broader level, it's just, I mean, you can see it in everything from like passes to go to the bathroom to the amount of time kids spend sitting during the day to lunch periods being only 20 minutes, like just sort of like normal from everything from the like most basic human needs up to really bigger things like is there relevance, purpose and meaning in the work that I'm doing? That's another human need. Uh, on all of those levels. It's not a, a, all a bad story. There's clearly teachers, pockets, places where those things happen. But on the whole, we kind of, we work for the bureaucracy instead of the bureaucracy working for us. <laughs> nice job. Um, and and I wanna hear more from you on what makes schools human, Devon. But I, I know that um, you just talked about the virtual mentors. That was an example of something that made your school more human. Um, were there other things like that that kind of worked for you as you look at this past year? And, and, and are those in fact the things that help make your school more human? I know that you did some work around discipline. You did some work around other things too. So talk to me about what worked for you. Yeah, um, jokingly, but seriously, I have to say, um, no tardies, right? Like, so if you're late to the Zoom, no tardies, right? Um, and, and honestly, why? Like, how do we, how can we get away from that? And I'm not saying that people don't need to be prompt and punctual. I needed to be here on time for this, for this live. And I get that, but I prioritize this over other things to make sure, because I'm going to tell you why because Jal is like the Jay-Z of education to me, and I wasn't going to miss this for the world. So I'm saying like I prioritize it. Our kids will do the exact same thing when it has the value in it, when it, they're connected and they see themselves in it. And so, um, you know, like I heard you say like, uh, you know, like, so what do we have to do to make things human? I think in my mind, it's like we have to create space as an opportunity for students to show their full selves, right? And it has to be intentional. Um, and, and we have to ask them questions like, what makes you smile during the day? And, and what, makes, what, what makes you thrive? And what's that thing in your stomach that burns you? Just like, I definitely want to do that. And you have to start there. And, and I'm not telling a math teacher, embed rap in your lesson. I don't, I mean, you'll have to process that and think through that, but it's okay for a calculus teacher to say, hey, what makes you smile, right? And what makes you, what makes you excited and just burns in your belly that just makes you, this is the thing I want. This is the thing I have to do. And then work from students' interest and go that route. Um, so I'm going to tell you just something from the academic side. We have these amazing people that I work with. They're neighborhood learning coordinators. They support each one of our assistant principals in our academies. Um, our academies are named after HBCUs, which I'd love to talk more to you about sometime. So our neighborhood learning coordinators are like the link between students, data, teachers, and they're supporting, like, that's, that's, their, that's their jam, so to speak. And so um, they came up with this idea. It is not mine. I just, the conditions were created and they ran with it called turn in and take out. We noticed kids were struggling. They weren't getting things turned in. And you just know if you come to my school, food is a part of our daily life. We offer lunch three, five, seven times throughout the day just so you can eat when you need to. Same thing with breakfast. We offer it multiple times so you can eat when you need to. So we realized in the pandemic, we don't have that opportunity. So we literally invited kids, ninth grade, um, students who are struggling in their classes or seniors who are struggling in math 
We had a theme around it who needed help. We had teachers in breakout rooms. Um, when you walked into the room, so to speak, uh, hey, I'm Devon here to work on world history. Um, you got to place an order for food. So one of our neighborhood learning quarters, almost like the dispatcher, and said, okay, Devon, what are we getting for you? Oh, I want a pepperoni pizza. I want a Diet Coke. And then I want to uh, give me apple pie too. Why not? And so then they sent you to your room to work in world history for about an hour. Then your food would come to your house and you could have dinner right there with your class or with a couple of kids in the, in the room with you. And they called that turn in takeout. We're not going to get rid of that. That needs to happen like in the future. But how cool to just share a pizza and chat on Zoom and just get work done and truly have this time with someone, right? They came up with that. Like I didn't, I mean, this is creating the conditions. I paid for part of it sometimes. We got teachers additional stipend to, to stay after. But it's like things like that where I can literally sit and just talk to John and have a connection with him. But we're going over we're going over world history and we're just getting things done. And so I needed to be in a different space, smaller. You fed me and you and you made it about me. Right. And so I think that's super important. Yeah. yeah. Phenomenal to hear. I love that story. And um, uh, I love the creativity there. And I think that's um, as we turn to questions from from you all in the audience, that's sort of something I'd love to think about I think this this question of, that, that had come up that I think you previewed for us Devon about what do we need to keep after this if I'd love to hear from both of you what would be on your list of things that must be different after um, you know whenever normal is and, and whatever that looks like again what what needs to be different that we need to keep from this year sure um, well first off, I mean, a number of people made this point, but I, I don't think we're trying to return to what we had before because clearly what we had before wasn't working for a lot of students, uh, particularly students of color and high poverty students, but also, you know, there have been these reports this year of students who were bullied in school, really like being uh, working at home, introverts really like working at home. So at everything from the sort of like macro inequalities to smaller things about people's personalities and social groups, like there were things that weren't working. So I think our goal is less to put it back and more to envision it in a way that works better for everybody and that draws on what we've learned from this year. So what have we learned from this year? I think one big thing is the, the student family teacher connection. I think, um, you know, it's it's always been a sort of ideal that like the family, the student and the teacher are working together. But in practice, I think in a lot of cases, like, y you know, um, teachers just want parents to push their kids to do their homework. And that's about the ex extent of the relationship they really want. And I think this year there's just been, you know, teachers have stared into kids' homes and they just have a much richer picture of what is actually happening at home. And we've sort of shifted the boundaries a little bit. And I think that's good. I think that there should be more uh, connection. I think in some schools um, uh, at the beginning of the year, they did some trust visits between faculty and families, sometimes over Zoom, sometimes in person. Um, it turns out that over Zoom or Google Meet is actually a good way for a lot of parents to meet, especially parents who are working because it's just more convenient. So I think we can we can keep one of that. So that's um, that's, that's one thing. Um, I think schools that have been more successful this year have taken care of the adults as well as the students. I'd love to hear Devon talk a little bit about his thinking in that respect, but it has been a really hard year for the teachers trying to online, hybrid, whatever it might be, teach while maybe also watching their own kids or taking care of elderly parents or um, and I think trying to support them in parallel ways, symmetrical ways to the ways that uh, they've supported students. I think that's a sort of uh, something that you would wanna keep going forward. Uh, Zoom chats, I don't know how we will replicate that exactly in person, but seems like it's been a good way for less confident or shyer students to communicate. And I'd love to, to build on that. All right, I'll stop there. I'm going to tell you, uh, Jal and I, um, I'm on another project with him and uh, we'll do, you will use the Zoom and he'll always have to redirect me to put my stuff in the Zoom because I'll just start talking. And I'm like, well, Jal, we think about this. And he's like, Devon, just put that in the chat for me. But, but um, so yes, um, I think we do have to replicate that because exactly, we have to be there for all students and what they need and so they can feel comfortable. So I think, um, Jal, I want to just respond one thing. You said taking care of staff. 
super important, right? And not packing every single minute. Like I'm, I'm the king. They call me less meeting La Rosa and that's okay. And that's totally okay. And I'm good with that name. And I'm like, if I can take a meeting off your plate, let me do that. And so like, A, doing that regularly. Um, I'm quite sure last Friday, I told people you should leave early today and go take a walk, see your child, do something, right? Um, don't tell HR, but HR might've just heard that, but it's okay, I'm good with it. But the other thing, one time early on in the pandemic, we tried this thing, we stopped the staff meeting and said, call somebody and connect, right? We're gonna talk for a little bit. I want you to stop and call somebody. If you don't have anybody's number, call me. If you don't, you don't, whatever the case may be. And it was super cool. And that was something that like kept on, right? And so stop and just call somebody and connect about something, right? And that can make complete sense. But like, it's, we have to sometimes get that reminder, right? Because teachers are rule followers and we love them, but it's okay just to stop the meeting and let's build intentional time to do something different. Um, the one thing that I hope changes and that I, I'm like, I have to change is the idea of assessment. And hopefully the pandemic has taught us something about the way we assess kids. Um, and so there's one particular student who was struggling at getting on the platform to type in the, the answers. And so we talked with the teacher. He was very open. I was like, how else can this student get this information? What if they just recorded um, their, uh, they had to do, um, they had to recite something and then explain something in Spanish. And so I'm like, rather than, than typing out, what if she just took her phone and just like, not even a loom, just recorded a 20 second video of what you're asking. He was like, that's perfect. I didn't even think alternative assessment or different way to deliver the exact same thing without all the, the, the pitfalls. I don't know that platform and logging in, I forgot my password, but I can get you the exact same thing. The kid ended up getting an A on the assignment. She was smiling ear to ear, but we solved a problem. And we paused with the student and the teacher and said, let's just think this through, we got this. Let's just think through what else can happen. Um, and it doesn't have to always be that way. Um, the other thing I would say is discipline. So 14 months, um, we have to do discipline completely different. 14 months, kids were at home, right? In, in, in Madison, I don't, in some schools were back and forth and had to so on and so forth. But for 14 months, so our kids, we had our first cohort come back yesterday. We had a DJ, we had a tunnel. We, we literally painted the front hallway that had not been painted in 63 years with wood paneling. And we painted it. I'm not even sure if I was supposed to, but we painted it a bright color. We had balloon tunnel and so on and so forth. It needed to be different, right? And so we think about conditions and making things different. Like they have to feel different because I'm going to tell you behavior comes from this. This hurts me. Like this is a dark, gloomy place. And, you, and I know I'm just going to get put out. But what if I told you we're all about restorative and you're not going to get put out? We're going to process and spend the time that we need and truly ask the questions and ask you, what do you need, right? And not lean to, you got to go. No, actually, you got to stay and you got to explain to me how we can help you, right? It's easy to put somebody out. What if we said, no, no, you've been out for 14 months. What if we stay? What if we truly get to the root of this? Because when you start digging, you're going to find many things and you have to be there. You have to. So we're going to a restorative approach. I'm putting it out here in the public and universe. Like um, we're going to we're going to rework everything that we know. And I have to ask permission. But like discipline shouldn't look like it did prior. Right. Mm -hmm. It should be completely different. And the last thing I'd say is something we did before the pandemic that we're truly leaning into is we can't do this alone. We're we're employing the community partners to come be a true partner with us. The school is not a bubble that sits in the community, but rather it needs to be hydrophilic and people just come right in, right? With, with protocols and, and so on and so forth. If you wanna come tutor calculus on Wednesdays to, to juniors, you should do that, right? But also getting strategic and asking students what they want and what they need and what will excite them. And then look for that in the community and bring it right in. We did that in the pandemic because we could. Like you get people from California to come pop in your Zoom and so on and so forth. And so why don't we keep that up? right? How can we bring local community members, but even the larger community? Why does it have to end? And so I think those are, those are my things I just had to get out there. So. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and, and that picks up on a lot of things that questioners have been asking. Um, and I think there's, including one aspect that's about students as partners, involving students in this effort as well. But, um, but, but Joel, I wanted to, there's lots of people asking about SEL, following up on that. And just this notion that like, how much pressure is there um, for educators to kind of, you know, deal with this? Like we have to make something up or make up content that was lost. Um, how can we prioritize SEL in the way that we know it has to be? Well, 
One thing that's been interesting is the the group that Devon and I've been working with has some Canadian educators in it. And in America, we talk about like academic learning and social emotional learning. And in Canada, they're like, we try to support our kids. And if we support our kids, then that helps them learn. How come you guys like box everything up into categories and uh, separate them? So, you know, I think um, particularly for kids who have lost uh, family members during the pandemic or, you know, kids just are hurting. They've like missed their friends. They've missed normal life. Um, the more the, the things really go together, you know, the more you can support them and make them feel sort of restored and whole and healed, the more able they are to learn. So I think those things really connect. I think there is going to be a lot of pressure around learning loss. I think um, it really makes sense not to think about that in a sign of a oh, one size fits all way. You know, if you have a first or second grader who really would have benefited from a specialist this year to learn how to read and they missed out on that, then by all means, do give them extra help in reading next year. But if you have a seventh grader who, you know, missed out on the French Indian War, just like move on to the next thing and, you know, use that space for for something else. Um, so I guess those are my two answers, sort of integrate and kind of curate, sort of select what's important and why, and do that against a real vision of what will benefit your kids in the long run. Like what kind of people are you trying to produce? The reason we care about learning loss is we think that if kids learn things that that will eventually help them become better citizens or workers and so forth. And if in the service of doing that, we like, you know, put them in like double dose of eat your broccoli stuff and they, you know, end up miserable about school, then like that's that's not really helping what, what we're trying to help in the long run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I, I, I want to acknowledge we have a lot of questions in the chat uh, or in the Q&A, um, some of which are about the, the virtual mentoring that Devon mentioned. I, I We're going to get information to people about that. I, I'm going to find time with you, Devon, at some point to do an interview with you and get some details on that um, so people can see if they can replicate that. Um, as we um, wrap up here, which and there's never enough time, but um, we haven't um, you know, scratched the surface, but it's been wonderful to hear just this inspiration. I, I wonder if there's just on the subject of taking care of people, both our parents and our educators, um, how would you, um, how would you kind of want to send people into the summer? Um, I th it has been exhausting. Um, and it's been just amazing, uh, the effort that people in schools have, have put uh, into creating um, a year like none other. If people are interested in doing this work, but just kind of feel like spent right now, are there, is there advice you might have for your teachers or your families about how do we go into the summer and kind of regroup or just refresh? And maybe it's just that simple, but um, maybe starting with Devon and then Jal, if you have any words of advice there. I think, um... The first thing I would say is like for, cause we talk about this idea of symmetry for myself, for teachers, for parents, for um, students, like reminding ourselves, we just did that, right? And in and, and correction, we are still doing that, right? So what I would say is like, we literally just like created an educational platform virtually, um, learn from afar. Like, and again, I have a second grader and watching what this young lady pulled off I'm saying is amazing. And watching that second year or that student teacher or that principal pull off what they just did, we have to pause and pat ourselves on the back. I know it feels weird because this isn't a job interview, but you have to take time and just say, you did that. You did all of that. And so I tell a seven-year-old young lady by the name of Devin that regularly, right? You did that. You just knocked that out the park. So first of all, we got it. I'm not worried about that problem you got wrong. We first have to recognize you did that and that's okay. Um, I think I think the other thing is I just want to quote one staff member. My name's Coach Javel Heggs. He's a track coach. He um, he taught me something. Keep love in your heart, twenty four seven. Don't let anything in to hurt you. Keep love in your heart. Keep that fire going. He's like, and you're gonna be all right. He'll walk down the hallway and just say that to me. I'll be like, needed that. Thank you. Had to do a meeting, and that's okay, right? Or he'll text me that at midnight, and that's totally okay. I'll stop there. Thank you. Wonderful, Charles. Wow. Um, yeah, I think just, I think one of the complicated things is that um, 
we need to kind of continue to reinvent schools, but teachers are really rightfully exhausted from what they've accomplished this year. So I think the right kind of pacing is to just sort of gather some thoughts at the end of the year, kind of what went, what went well from this year, what would we wanna keep when we go back to school, like more regular school next year, like what don't we wanna go back to, but not try to, you know, have big committees and make big changes. Just sort of start the conversation and then continue those uh, conversations into next year. I would love it in communities where um, um, where things have gone well, if parents could um, essentially sponsor some sort of thank you uh, for, for teachers and all the, the work they've done this year. I think that would go uh, a long way. Yeah, I hear that. Um, wow. Um... Thank you both. Um, incredible honor to have uh, you to be able to share these thoughts. Um, just uh, thank you both for being here. And I, I, will, uh, I will take this with me. I hope our audience uh, will as well. Um, I wanna thank everybody uh, for joining us for this conversation. Um, please stay in touch. Um, you can uh, visit us uh, at our website at hgse.me slash ednow. Couple things coming up. Um, as we as we end out this this year, um, really uh, great stuff, and let's let's keep doing it. Um, take care and uh, stay well, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>